And number two is وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ These two verses came down, and when these two verses came down, that was when the Prophet was commanded to go public. That was when he had to go public. And we said a number of things began immediately. Uh, of them is they tried to convince Abu Talib, and then uh, they tried to block the da'wah uh, indirectly, and then they had a showdown with Abu Talib. Right? We all mentioned this last week. Now we're continuing. What else did they do in order to prevent the prophetic message from being uh, taught to others? Uh, the third thing that we'll mention is that they tried to ban the recitation of the Qur'an in public. They tried to make it that if the Qur'an were recited, they would drown it out with their voices or they would not even allow it to be recited. Ibn Abbas mentions that whenever the Prophet raised his voice for the Qur'an in front of the Kaaba, the Quraysh would begin shouting and yelling and screaming and cursing the one who revealed it, A'udhu Billah, and the one upon whom it was revealed, A'udhu Billah, cursing him. They would, يعني, they, would, they would curse him and try to drown out the voice of the Qur'an. And they would not allow anyone to listen to the Qur'an. And therefore Ibn Abbas said, if somebody wanted to listen to the Qur'an, he would have to pretend as if he's not listening. And try to hear the Qur'an over the din of the Quraysh yelling and screaming. And that was when Allah revealed in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Isra verse 110, that Allah says uh, that... Uh, uh, that do not say loudly the Qur'an, do not say it loudly and do not say it in a whisper, but say it in a moderate voice. Why? Because the Prophet wanted to raise his voice above the voice of the Quraysh. And, the Prophet, and Allah said, no, that's not going to win. You recite the way you're supposed to. You recite the way you're supposed to, ignore that din, ignore that shouting and yelling and screaming. You do what you're supposed to and the da'wah will spread. And once the companions came together in the house of Al-Arqam, we'll talk about Dar Al-Arqam inshallah uh, in our next lesson. They came together in the house of Al-Arqam and they said, no one has recited the Qur'an in public other than the Prophet ﷺ. Who is going to volunteer? So subhanAllah, no one had the courage to recite the Qur'an in public. It was banned, basically. No one had recited the Qur'an in public. Who's going to volunteer? And so Ibn Mas'ud said, I volunteer. They said, Oh Ibn Mas'ud, we want somebody else. Because, who can tell me why? He's not one of the Quraysh. He's not even Qurayshi. Right? Forget Ilid, he's not even Makki. Yani Aslan, he's not even from the Quraysh. He is from one of the Yemeni tribes. Right? So uh, uh, they said, oh, oh Ibn Mas'ud, we don't want you because you don't have family members to help you and protect you. You don't have an Ashira. You don't have a tribe. And basically, as we said over and over again, everything in that time is based upon lineage. Everything. We need to understand, just like in our times, the American passport abroad, as for Muslims in America, there's a different story. But abroad, the American passport is supposed to wait, hold, hold something, right? If a, if a government stops you, you say, hey, ho, I'm an American. Careful. You pull out the passport. This is your protection. So in those days, you're Qurashi. You have that protection. Or you're Banu Makhzum, or you're Banu, uh, Banu uh, uh, Hashim, or whoever you are. Ibn Mas'ud is nobody. He's a Yemeni. He's not a Qurashi. So they said, no, no, we don't want you. We want somebody else. Ibn Mas'ud said, no, I'm the one who wants to do it. He volunteers. And he said, I put my trust in Allah. Allah will protect me. And subhanAllah, this is Ibn Mas'ud. Ibn Mas'ud is the one whom the Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to read the Qur'an as it was revealed, then we take it from Ibn Umm Abd, that is Ibn Mas'ud, right? غَضًّا طَرِيًّا كَمَا أُنزِل يعني fresh and ripe as it was revealed. If you want to recite the Qur'an properly, Ibn Mas'ud is the one, take the Qur'an from these four, and Ibn Mas'ud is them. Ibn Mas'ud is the one who says, I have taken more than 70 surahs directly from the Prophet's mouth to my mouth. I don't have anybody else as a Qur'an teacher. More than 70 surahs I took, and so Ibn Mas'ud is an expert in Qur'an, and it is his passion. And so he goes, no, I want to do this, right? And he has every right to because of who he is in terms of his Qur'an and status with the Qur'an. And so they said, okay, if you are insisting, then go. So he began, he went to Mecca the next morning. He went to the Kaaba, excuse me. He went to the Kaaba the next morning when 
the people had gathered. You know that uh, this was their, the Kaaba was basically their place of socialization. When they finished their chores, when they finished their buying and selling, there was a time they would all just sit in the shade and they would just gossip and chit chat. This was their, the version of the coffee shop, right? This was their majlis in front of the Kaaba. So this was where everybody sat in the after, in the time when they sat. So Ibn Mas'ud went at that time and he stood at the maqam of Ibrahim. And he began reciting in a loud, beautiful voice. And Ibn Mas'ud had the voice of a Qari. He was the Qari of the Sahaba. He was the Qari of the Sahaba. He began reciting in a beautiful voice, Surah Ar-Rahman. One of the early surahs, right? And one of the most beautiful surahs. And it was so beautiful, people began gathering around him to listen. People began gathering around him to listen. And one of them said, what is this that he's reciting? And he's reciting tilawa. And the Quraysh had never heard this type of tilawa. They had never seen this type of tilawa. Realize that the whole science of tilawa, of tajweed, it is specific to the Quran. The Arabs didn't choose to speak in ghunnas and mudud. Right? They're not speaking the way that the Quran is recited. The whole art of tilawa and the words of the Quran, all of it is to a different level. All of it. And so they're not used to this type. And it is mesmerizing. And so Ibn Mas'ud be begins to tilawa. with the people come around him. And they begin talking because he's not answering. He's reciting. And so they begin talking. What is this? This is what interesting. What is he reciting? One of them finally says, Oh, this is what Muhammad has claimed has been revealed to him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is now the Quran. Now the cat is let out of the bag. Oh, this is what Ibn Mas'ud is reciting. So immediately some of them pounced on him. Others are wanting to listen. Some of them pounced on him and began beating him and taking their shoe off and, and hitting him. Because he is not a Qurashi. Nobody is going to defend him. Nobody is going to defend him. He is by himself. And they continued to physically beat him until he could not continue reciting. He wasn't able to finish two pages of Surah Al-Rahman. He wasn't able to finish that. And he came back bloodied and battered and bruised. And the Sahaba said, Wallahi hadha ma kunna nakhsha alayk. This is exactly what we were worried about. That's why we didn't want you to go and do this. And Ibn Mas'ud said, Wallahi, after today, nothing has increased other than my contempt for the Quraysh. And I'm willing to go do this again tomorrow. Come, just challenge me. I'm going to do this tomorrow. Right? I've only increased in my contempt that how could you have done this and, 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 and stoop to this level? I want to do this again tomorrow. And so uh, uh, the, 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 the Sahaba said, Kafak, enough. Enough is enough. We didn't expect you. Uh, and you've done enough to distress them. They have heard the Quran and you have caused them to be distressed. And of course, you all know the, the famous story that Ibn Ishaq mentions and Tabarani and others mention the famous story of uh, the three leaders of the Quraysh, Abu Abu Jahl, uh, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, and Al Akhnas ibn Shariq. Uh, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, and Al Akhnas. These three were uh, of the seniors and elders. That because the Quran is not being recited publicly, and yet they've heard bits and pieces, they have been mesmerized by it. And so they have a desire to listen to it. But you can't do it in public. So when do they do it? You all know the story, and it is an authentic story. That because the Prophet would pray to Hajjud every morning, and in tahajjud, he would raise his voice with the Qur'an and he would recite it. And of course, remember, this is a small society, a peaceful village. You don't have the traffic noise. You don't. When the Prophet is reciting in his house at 3 a.m., the neighbors will hear if they want to. Right? It's a dead of the night. It's that type of society, small village. As I said, less than a thousand people in Mecca. And it's dead quiet at 3, 4 a.m. So when he's in his house reciting the Qur'an, at that time, you have the opportunity to listen from outside. And so it so happened that, as we said, Al Akhnas, Abu Sufyan, and Abu Jahl, these three, they bumped into one another at Fajr because that's when the Prophet stopped reciting, right? They bumped into one another at Fajr and they all three realized that there's only one reason they're outside at 4 a.m., right? Uh, close to the Prophet's house, and that is to listen to the Quran. And they all try to make an excuse and they this and that, but inside they all know the reason, but they don't want to admit it, right? The second night, the same thing happens. 
And they all again bump into one another. And so they're all listening from a different alleyway because their houses might be in different areas. But when they're going home and they're returning, they go down the main alleyway and they bump into one another again when the Prophet ﷺ stops, right? So they're mesmerized up until basically the pre fajr As you know, tahajjud lasts until that time. So when the Prophet ﷺ stops, they then return home and once again. So then they say, okay, we're not going to do this again. But for the third time it happens and they're so embarrassed, they say, look, if the people here that we're doing this will lose respect respect in their eyes, let us make a promise to Allah, we're not going to come and listen to the Qur'an again. Now before I move on to this riwayah, I want you to understand what passion will motivate a person to get out of bed at 3-4 in the morning and to walk to somebody else's house to listen and stand in darkness, in the chill of the night complete. You leave your bed to go listen to the recitation. And you know, subhanAllah, one of the things that I pray that Allah blesses me and all of you with, we always love to hear the beautiful Qur'an of the Qur'an. My favorite is Husari and Manshawi and Abdul Basit. Many of you like Afasi. Well, can you imagine those who were fortunate to listen to the Prophet Muhammad's voice? Can you imagine how that would have moved them, right? If these people move us and they are basically normal Qur'an, you know, can you imagine the voice and the tilawa of Rasulullah himself? And I sincerely make dua to Allah that one day He allows me to listen to that tilawa and to all of you, insha'Allah ta'ala. So the tilawa coming from the, the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can you imagine yani what, what emotions would be playing? So for these three men, and they're all elders, they're all in their 50s, right? They're all old people. To leave bed and to come and stand outside, to listen to the tilawa of the Prophet it is something that they cannot do in public, they have to do in private. And so they make a promise to Allah, okay, that's it. If we are discovered, it's going to be a big embarrassment. So let us keep this secret. The next morning, the morning of the fourth day, in al tabarani is reported, Al-Akhnas came to Abu Sufyan, and he said to Abu Sufyan, Oh Abu Sufyan, what is your opinion about what we heard? What is your opinion? Abu Sufyan is embarrassed and he goes, First you tell me your opinion. Well, I like kids. Like kids, because he's too embarrassed, you know. First you tell me yours, then I'll tell you mine, right? I'm not going to say it until you say it. This is Abu Sufyan, because Abu Sufyan is the most sympathetic of the three. And Abu Sufyan will be the one who accepts Islam the earliest, right? This is Abu Sufyan. So you can tell automatically something is happening. As for Al-Akhnas, uh, people have differed, did he accept Islam or not? One opinion is that he accepted Islam. We don't know much about Al-Akhnas, what happened to him. Of course, Abu Jahl is Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is the Fir'aun of the Ummah. So Al-Akhnas goes to Abu Sufyan and he asks Abu Sufyan, what did you think of the recitation? Abu Sufyan says, first you tell me, then I'll tell you. So Al-Akhnas says, Wallahi, it seems to be Al-Haq, the truth. It seems to be the truth. Abu Sufyan is embarrassed to admit fully. And so he says to Al-Akhnas, some of what he said, I understood everything, and others was beyond my comprehension. In other words, he didn't give a correct opinion. He basically said it was so eloquent, I understood certain words, and I didn't understand other words, right? So he gave a, a wishy-washy answer. He gave a vague answer. He didn't give his full opinion. Of course, his full opinion, he knows it's the truth. Eventually, he accepts Islam. But for now, he goes, well, my opinion is this. He's being Abu Sufyan, by the way, he's a politician, right? His son is Muawiyah, and they founded the Umayyad dynasty, okay? This is, this is, he's, he does not want any slip to come out. He's guarding, you, you have to be a, a, a politician, I mean this in a positive way, because you have good politicians as well. And as Ibn Hajar says, the best politician or the best king the Ummah has ever seen is Muawiyah, because he's a Sahabi. Okay, so we have nothing but praise for Muawiyah and his father Abu Sufyan, but he's a politician. So he doesn't want any phrase to be spread, even accidentally, so he doesn't give his full opinion. He said, something of what I heard was good and other things I didn't understand. He gives a wishy-washy answer. Then Al-Akhnas goes to Abu Jahl. And he says, oh Abu Jahl, I want to know your honest opinion about what we heard. What is the verdict? Because Al-Akhnas thinks this is the truth. He's moved. And so he goes to Abu Jahl. What tribe was Abu Jahl from? The sub-tribe. Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum, right? Uh, 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 Abu Sufyan is from the Umayyad tribe. And so these three are the main tribes of the Quraysh. You have to know this by now. The Banu Makhzum, and that's Abu Jahl. Uh, that's Khalid ibn al-Walid. These are Abu Makhzums. And then you have the uh, Umayyads, and then uh, the Banu Umayyah. 
And of course, they, they become the Umayyads later on. And then you have the Banu Hashim. You have more than this, but these are the three main ones that we are interested in for, for the Sira in particular. So, uh, Abu Sufyan is the leader of the, the Banu uh, Makhzum, uh, the, the, the Banu Umayyah. Uh, Abu Jahl is the leader of, or one of the leaders. He's not the main leader. One of the leaders of the Banu Makhzum. He's one of the tall guys or the big guys of the Banu Makhzum. The elites of the Banu Makhzum. So he goes to Abu Jahl. He says, what did you think? And Abu Jahl says, and this is now he is coming clean about why he doesn't accept Islam. And Abu Jahl says the same thing to another person who converted to Islam. And he tells us the same, same statement. So we have this from two different people. Exactly what Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl says. Abu Jahl says, the Banu Manaf, the Banu Hashim, because Manaf is the grandfather, the Banu Manaf and us, we have always been in competition with one another. And when they began to give food to the pilgrims, we also began to give food. When they began to give water, we began to give water to the pilgrims. Because the Banu, uh, as we said many, many months ago, uh, the Banu Manaf, they excelled in hospitality. And so they became the most noble of the sub-tribes of the Quraysh. Whenever they did something, the Banu Makhzum had to follow suit. Okay? And so when they gave water, we also started giving water. When they showed the bravery, we showed bravery. When they had the flag of battle, we had the flag of battle. Until finally, we were like two horses about to get to the finish line. Kafara Sayrihan means just about to get to the finish line. We're battling, you know, right at the end of the race. And now they come and they tell us they have a prophet whom Allah inspires from the heavens, how can we compete with that? <laughs> how can we win the race? And so, wallahi, as long as I live, I will never accept him. Notice his response is honest. Honest, that the reason I cannot follow him is because he is my competitor. Not because he doesn't have the truth, right? Because I am from the Banu Makhzum, and he is from the Banu Manaf or the Banu Hashim, and we have always been trailing behind them. Now if I'm going to admit it, and again it goes back to Jahili, nose, snobbery, arrogance, my lineage, my father and grandfather. It all goes back to that, right? SubhanAllah, even Abu Talib had the same reason he couldn't accept Islam. You understand how much this was a part of their uh, culture. And so, as we said, one of the tactics was to try to prevent the recitation of the Qur'an. And Allah mentions this as well. That when they hear the Qur'an, they say to another, إِلْغَوْ فِيهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَغْلِبُونَ That you just start murmuring, start shouting, so that you will overcome the Qur'an. And Allah says, you're never going to be able to do that. So this was the third tactic we mentioned. The fourth tactic was to ridicule the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. To say things about them, to make others laugh at them, to make others scoff them. And this is of course the general methodology of all the people who oppose uh, the truth, even in our times, how they ridicule Islam and how they ridicule what uh, Muslim cultures might do. They'll make fun of it uh, and, and they'll just give us a, a, a racist joke about Islam. This is common to this time. And so uh, many reports are reported here. Once uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not receive any new revelation for a number of weeks or a number of months. And so one of the ladies of the Quraysh, perhaps it was the wife of Abu Jahl, we don't know. One of the ladies of the Quraysh mocked him in front of him and said that, I see that your shaitan has abandoned you. Meaning Jibreel. I see that your shaitan has abandoned you because you haven't recited anything new. And so the Prophet really felt hurt at this. And he felt grieved. And at this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Your Lord has neither abandoned you, nor shown you any uh, anger or hostility, uh, nor has He left you. وَلَلْآخِرِذُ خَيْرُ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى And the future is going to be better for you than, uh, than the present. And this means the future in this world and the future in the next world. Be patient. He was greatly grieved when one of the women is mocking him. SubhanAllah, that's human nature when somebody makes fun of you. How about an elderly lady making fun of you? He really felt hurt at this. And so Allah calmed him down and Allah consoled him and said, And you will be given until you are content. Be patient. And the surah goes on. And I have given a khutbah about this surah. And, and uh, we talked about that surah in that uh, khutbah. Uh, also, uh, especially Abu Jahl. Especially Abu Jahl would go out of his way and personally try his best to smear the religion. If the person were a person of status, he would make fun of him. And if he were a person of lowliness, he would get physical with him. And if it were a person of status, he would go and tell him, 
How can you leave the religion of your forefather? Was your father worse than you or are you better than your father? Again, this was a common Arab thing. Your father and your grandfather must be better than you. So they, they ask him bluntly, are you better than your father and grandfather? And they mention whoever was their grandfather, the famous founder of the tribe, whether it's Maghzum, whether it's Umayyah, whether it's Manaf, are you better than them? Or are they better than you? And he would try to boycott them uh, and not engage in trade with them. And if you were weak, he would physically intimidate them. And one uh, of the stories mentioned by Ibn Ishaq uh, in his seerah, one of the stories mentioned is that once uh, someone did not pay Abu Jahl, uh, sorry, someone purchased something from Abu Jahl, someone purchased something from Abu Jahl uh, and refused to pay him the amount. Abu Jahl did not pay him and he kept on stalling and stalling and stalling. And so one day when this man came and he wanted to get his money back, Abu Jahl said, to, he wasn't from the Quraysh, he didn't know all of this. Abu Jahl said to him, uh, go to Muhammad وسلم, and he will get it for you. He will get it for you, he will give it to you. So he said it to him as basically a, a joke, you know. Go to Muhammad and he's going to give the, the money back, right? So the man came and he didn't know what's happening. He didn't know that this is just a joke, right? The man came to the Prophet's house, knocked on it, told him that, you know, Abu Jahl owes me money and this is the amount and he's told me to come and collect it from you. Because of what the idea was, was that the Prophet might owe Abu Jahl money, so instead of giving it back to Abu Jahl, he give it to the man. So you understand the point, there's a debt here, so the man thought, you must owe Abu Jahl money, instead of giving him the money, uh, give it back to me, I'll take it. So the Prophet said, don't worry, I will get your money back for you. I will get your money back for you. He took the man by the hand, and he walked right then and there to the house of Abu Jahl, and he knocked on the door. And uh, when the door opened, the, Abu Jahl was shocked to see the Prophet with this man. You know, and the Prophet said to him, Ya Abu Jahl, give the man his money back now. Abu Jahl, his face changed to complete white. And he began trembling. And he rushed back home and he handed a whole bag that he had without even counting. He just threw it at the man. And he said, here, go. And so the man did not understand. He thought, okay, well, Abu Jahl was right that he would get my money back. He got my money back. The man went his way. Later on, Abu Jahl's friend came and said, how could you have given the man his money when you kept on refusing? And when the Prophet asked, or when Muhammad asked, you gave it to him. He said, I saw behind him. I saw behind him what you didn't see, right? Behind the Prophet right? I saw behind him what you did not see. That terrified me. According to one report, he saw a herd of angry camels waiting to pounce on him. And this is of course Allah's yani, uh, miracle. He saw a herd of angry camels, and camels can get very angry and nasty, right? Waiting to pounce on him, and his flesh just changed because he knows these are not human camels, or not regular camels, right? He knows this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so his face changes, he just throws him his whole wallet. He goes, khalas, go, this is your money, and go. So, of course, here is Abu Jahl trying to smear the Prophet sallallahu and in fact, the opposite happened. Another tactic, the fifth tactic, is false accusations, not just joking, but slander. Not just throwing these pranks, but downright, outright lies. And here is where the Quraysh, of course, they went, to, they stooped to a level they had never stooped to before, and they began to lie about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran mentions three or four or five of their particular lies. And what is amazing is that to this day, every non-Muslim who rejects Islam has to say one of these lies about the Prophet ﷺ. He cannot get out of the same lies that are mentioned in the Qur'an. So of these lies, وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّهُ لَمَجْنُونَ He's crazy. Even though the Quraysh knew the Prophet ﷺ is not crazy, right? فَقَدْ لَبِثُّ فِيكُمْ عُمُرًا مِّنْ قَبْلِهِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ The Quran says, I lived a whole lifetime amongst you. You know me. Can't you think? You know me who I am. And so they say he is crazy. Of them they say, he is a kahin, a fortune teller. Of them they say he is a sahir. He's either a sahir or a mashur. They can't even make up their minds. Sometimes he's the magician and sometimes magic has been done on him. Right? What, what, both of these accusations are given. And to this day, those people who reject Islam, they have to say s some things like this. And the most common understanding that most academics who are not Muslims have is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was deluded into thinking he's a prophet, which is a type of madness. You think you're hearing voices, right? And it is impossible for a man to be crazy in one area 
and completely sane in every other area. As a family man, as a, as a person of a leader, as this and that, everything else is completely top notch. And yet in one area, they say he must have been hearing, because they cannot doubt his sincerity. He was sincere in his message, they know it. How can you be sincere when you're not telling the truth? Well, then you think you're telling the truth. How can you think you're telling the truth when you, God is speaking to you? This is your imagination. Right? And they accused him of being a poet. And this is standard to this day. He was a, uh, a marvelous poet, they say. He had a command of the Arabic. But Allah tells us in the Quran, I lived 40 years before this. I never wrote any book. I never wrote any poetry. Before this, I was not known for poetry. And the process until the day he passed away, he hardly mentioned any lines of poetry. Perhaps two or three lines of poetry ever crossed his mouth, right? Uh, that the most, he, one phrase, he, in fact, according to one scholar, is it Ibn Hajar, he said, never did the Prophet give a full couplet of poetry. You know, Arabs have couplets. You have rhyming. Uh, uh, you know, they have the uh, uh, two halves of a sentence, right? Couplet. Never did the Prophet give a whole couplet of poetry. Only one half of it, at max. And if you look at the seerah, it seems to be the case. So the Prophet never gave poetry. And yet, when the Qur'an comes out, it is beyond what they can understand. And the main story that I want every one of us to know and memorize is the story of, uh, the, uh, is the story of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Because really, this is the standard story that shows uh, how they had to interpret the Qur'an. And this is something, again and again, I point out, the Qur'an was something unprecedented. They had never heard a language, a style, the words, the rhythm, the tone, everything is completely unprecedented. And all of you who are Arabs and who speak Arabic, compare the Qur'an to any poetry. Compare it to any poetry. Wallahi, it is nothing like human poetry, right? Compare it to the Diwan of Al-A'sha, Diwan of Mutanabbi, Diwan of Al-Shafi'i, completely different. The Qur'an is, nothing is like it, because it is the speech of Allah Azza wa Jal. So imagine the Qur'an being recited to the masters of the Arab, Arabic language, right? These are the living legends are alive. And the greatest poet of Mecca was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. And Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was also the chieftain of the Banu Makhzum. Just like Abu Talib was the chieftain of the Banu Hashim, Al-Walid was the chief and Abu Jahl was his vice minister. Right, this is the second in command. Al Walid ibn al Mughira was the, the big guy of the Banu Makhzum. And he was the unparalleled poet of Mecca. He was the Shakespeare of Mecca. When the people of Quraysh competed with Hawazin, with Thaqif, with the other tribes in poetry, Al Walid would represent. He's going to the matches, he's going to the finals. Right? This is who Al Walid is. He is the father of Khalid ibn al Walid. Khalid is his son. Okay, Khalid ibn al-Walid, his father is al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Okay, so al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira is the, the senior of the Banu Makhzum. And once the Prophet was reciting the Quran in Mecca, in, the, in, in front of the Kaaba, and al-Walid managed to listen uninterrupted for the first time. Because before this, they're drowning out the voices. For the first time, al-Walid listens to the Quran, and he's mesmer, he stops in his tracks. And he listens until the Prophet finishes. And he goes away a changed man. And he mutters something that spread in the people of Mecca. The people of Mecca were few. Anybody says something, everything spreads. Gossip is rampant in Mecca, right? And he says something uh, when he's walking away. Wallahi laqad sami'tum min Muhammadin kalaman anifan. Ma huwa min kalaman insi wala min kalam al jinn. I have heard a speech from Muhammad right now. It is neither from the speech of men or the speech of jinn. Even what he said is so beautiful. It's a ridge. It's, a, uh, uh, it's not poetry, but it is a, a type of beautiful. Yeah, it's, even to translate it is problematic prose. It's a beautiful prose. What he is saying is uh, the top of it is fertile. Uh, the, 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 the height of it is, is beautiful. It has a halawa and it has a rhythm. Again, these are synonyms here. We don't translate word by word. And it surpasses everything I've heard. And nothing can surpass it. He's describing the Quran as a pagan. I've never heard anything like this. Neither from the kalam of ins nor from the kalam al-jinn. The people panicked. Our poet is admitting defeat in one instance. 
Just one recitation. And this is his, so the news spread everywhere, right? When it reached Abu Jahl, he said, leave it to me, don't worry. I'll take care of it. Abu Jahl is the second in command. Abu Jahl immediately goes to the house of Al-Walid. And he, sa he tells Al-Walid that your people, O oh Al-Walid, your people have heard that you have praised the Quran. And they will not be satisfied with you until you dissociate from Muhammad yeah. Your people have heard your praise of the Quran and, and he's one of them by the way. You meaning, your people meaning me too. They will not be satisfied with you until you say something against it just like you praised it. Pause here, footnote, compare this to Abu Talib. Compare this to Abu Talib. Last week what we mentioned about Abu Talib. When the people of Mecca came and said, we will not be satisfied with you until you hand over Muhammad Sallallahu And he stood his ground. And he did not bow down or cower. And he said, do as you please, I am not going to do it. This is what you call a true leader. Al-Walid is your regular politician. And when he's told, you're not going to get the votes, you've got to sing the tune. Instantaneously. Because as we keep on telling, Wallahi, when you understand Tawheed, you cannot fear anyone or respect any of, of, uh, of those who are not fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A politician is one of the most servile of all human beings because they go with the wind. They will sell their, you know, the average politician, they will sell their morals for the sake of the votes. Right? They are not leaders, they are followers, as Ibn Taymiyyah says. That the politicians, the, siya the ones in siyasa, they are not leaders, they are the followers. They have to follow the whims of society. And this is a classic example. That here you have Al-Walid Al-Mughira, who pretends to be so bossy and so famous and what not. As soon as he hears, he's getting unpopular. you got to sing another tune. He says, Abu Jahl, what do you want me to say? Tell me. First thing, what do you want me to say? Tell me, I'll say it. And so Abu Jahl says, call him a madman. Al-Walid says, but he's not a madman. And everybody knows he's not a madman. And we've seen crazy people, and he has no symptoms of a crazy man. So then Abu, uh, Abu Jahl says, okay, call him a kahin. Call him a fortune teller. But <laughs> Walid says, but he's not a fortune teller. Like he's trying to be honest here, right? He's not a fortune teller. And he doesn't have the dandana or the mazmara of the, of the kahana. The kahana had a way of speaking. Uh, and he doesn't have that. So say he's a magician. But he's not a magician. And the magicians have... Uh, you know, their, 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 their invocations and their uh, tarot cards, whatever they had over their time. He doesn't have any of this, right? So say he's a poet. And then Walid said, by Allah, I am the best poet amongst you. Here he wouldn't agree that I am the poet, right? <laughs> because I am the best poet amongst you. And none of you can compete in poetry than me. And I am telling you that this is not uh, the type of poetry that we are used to, right? So then Abu Jahl said, you need to say something. And we will not be satisfied. Now he says, we. We will not be satisfied with you until you say something. So he said, leave me alone for a few days. And he began walking around in his house thinking about what he is going to say. And he's frowning and he's going about back and forth. What am I going to say? And then he finally comes across an idea. I know what I'm going to say. That this is, and before he could say it, Allah revealed in the Quran exactly what is happening in the privacy of his house and the feelings in his heart and the expressions in his face that nobody, even his family, did not know. And Allah revealed it in the Quran. Right? Look at the beauty of the Quran coinciding with reality that before he can say something, the Prophet recites it and exposes him. Surah Al Muddathir. The, the second portion. ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقْتُ وَحِيدًا Allah is speaking directly to Al-Walid. And wallahi, nobody wants to be in Al-Walid's shoes now. Directly Allah is speaking in the first person. Leave me alone with the one whom I created. All alone. وَجَعَلْتُ لَهُ مَالًا مَمْدُودًا وَبَنِينَ شُهُودًا I gave him all of his money and so many sons. He had so many sons. Khalid is one of them. And these are one of the Banin. Allah references Khalid indirectly. وَبَنِينَ شُهُودًا وَمَهَّدْتُ لَهُ تَمْهِيدًا And I prepared everything for him. ثُمَّ يَطْمَعُ وَنْ أَزِيدًا And he still wanted more. Right? كَلَّا إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِآيَاتِنَا عَنِيدًا Verily, he was an obstinate, stubborn person when he heard our verses. 
And Allah goes on and describes that when he heard the Quran, إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرْ فَقُتِلْ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ He began plotting and planning and thinking. May he be cursed how he tried to plot and plan, right? ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرْ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرْ He frowned and he's walking around. He's pacing in his house. Allah describes it in the Quran. And nobody knew this, how he's feeling and what his expressions are. Not even his family because he's all alone. And Allah tells it to him. In the Quran, we recite to this day. And then he said, and Allah said what he would say. That the worst he could say is, in هَذَا illa sihrun yu'thar, in هَذَا illa قَوْلُ bashar. This is a special type of magic. Special type of magic that is coming from a man. It's a special type of magic. That's all he could say, right? And Allah says, سَأُسْلِيهِ سَقَرْ I am going to cause him to go into the blazing fire. And wallahi, even these verses are so powerful in the Arabic language that Allah is challenging Al-Walid. Do you think you can beat my speech? Even the verses of Muddathir are so powerful, of the most powerful of the early uh, revelations. And this clearly shows us that, of course, Al-Walid died a pagan because again, the same arrogant. He was the chieftain of the Banu Maghzum. Al-Walid died a pagan and... SubhanAllah, both of his sons accepted Islam. Both of his elder sons, uh, Khalid and the elder brother, uh, they both accepted uh, Islam later on in their lives, not at this point in time. So he said this is the fifth point and that was uh, to try to smear the Prophet ﷺ. And there are many stories. Uh, it is also narrated that Abu Jahl would stand outside of Mecca during the pilgrimage season. And before the pilgrims arrived, he'd make a public announcement that listen, careful, there is a madman in town. Sometimes Abu Lahab would do this as well. And he would say, that's my nephew. My nephew has gone crazy. And I warn you, do not listen to him. Because if you do, you will be mesmerized. He is a magician who will mesmerize you. Who will completely uh, captivate you. So when you see him, turn around. Put your hands in your ears, right? You cover your ears up. Do not listen to him. And subhanAllah, this was the cause of the conversion of more than one person. One of them... Uh, one of them said that, oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a madman, I'm a doctor, I'll cure him. So he went and, and went to the Prophet ﷺ and uh, he said to the Prophet ﷺ that I have heard that you are a madman or you have possession or something and I'm a doctor and I don't mind curing you. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I'm not a madman, but listen to my message. And he said, the khutbatul haja, inna alhamdulillah. نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له. He went to the. He didn't even get to the message, and the man said, "Stop. Repeat what you have just said." He repeated the خطبة الحاجة. يعني this is not even the خطبة. This is what you say in the beginning. And he goes, Wallahi, I have never heard anything as beautiful than this. What are you? I am a prophet. And then he began and he accepted Islam. SubhanAllah, right? So, of course, it backfired on some, but the bulk of people, I mean, imagine being stopped before you enter a city and you're told, that's a disaster, that's a person, crazy man. Of course, you're going to listen. And so the bulk of the people did not listen and they, and they uh, were um, persuaded to avoid the Prophet because of Abu Jahl, because of Abu Lahab and the other leaders. Uh, the sixth point that we'll mention, of their tactics. Again, all of these are tactics that we're mentioning. What did they do? The sixth point we'll mention, sometimes they try to challenge the Prophet ﷺ for a miracle. And they demanded to see something with their eyes. And again, Allah mentions many such challenges that they asked for. Of them is mentioned in Surah Al-Isra. And Surah Al-Isra is an early Meccan Surah, mid-Meccan Surah. In Surah Al-Isra, they say, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعَ They say, we're never going to believe in you until you cause the earth to spring forth water. Yambur, Yambur, now in Arabic, Yambur is a place of, of water coming forth, right? A, 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 a well coming forth. We're never going to believe you until we see with our eyes a well just created. Or you are simply blessed instantaneously out of nowhere in the desert. The desert is transformed into grapes and into grapes and dates. Grapes were not a Meccan fruit. They don't grow in Mecca, right? But they want grapes, everybody knows, they're the most luscious of fruits. So they say, if you truly are a prophet, convert this desert into grapes and, uh, and dates. And so we can eat from it. Or break up the skies, as you say that Allah says in the Quran, Allah is saying that the sky is going to break up on the day of judgment. Do it now. Show us the skies breaking up. 
أو تأتي بالله والملائكة قبيلة. Or why don't you bring Allah Himself and bring the angels so that we see them? أو يكون لك بيت من زخرف أو ترقى في السماء. Or have your house transformed into gold, into uh, jewelry. Or go up to the heavens as we're watching you, right? And they say ولا نؤمن لرقيك حتى تنزل علينا كتاب نقرأه. And we're never going to listen to your murmuring. رقيك here means your muttering until we see a book coming down from the heavens. And then Allah tells them to say قل سبحان ربي هل كنت إلا بشر الرسول. Say سبحان ربي. I am only a bashar. I am only a rasul. I am not God walking on earth. Now. Question arises, why didn't Allah give them all of these miracles? Why not? He is a prophet. To respond, number one, He did give them some miracles. He did. And of those miracles, the most famous of them is mentioned in the Quran. And they challenged him and they said, if you are truly a prophet, show us the, sun, the, the moon splitting. And so, he made a dua to Allah and they saw the two halves of the moon. And this is mentioned in the Quran. They saw the two halves of the moon, one on each side of the mountain of Safa, right? And they turned around and they said, oh, he's bewitched our eyes. He's bewitched our eyes. Number two, the second reason that uh, no miracle was revealed was that Allah revealed the greatest miracle, and that is the Quran. And Allah kept on emphasizing this, that this is your miracle. Number three, why didn't Allah reveal a miracle is that Allah knows that they are asking out of stubbornness and arrogance. And this is proven by the fact that when the miracle is shown, they reject it, such as the moon, right? And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَوْ أَنَّنَا نَزَّلْنَا إِلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَكَلَّمَهُمُ الْمَوْتَ وَحَشَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ قُبُلًا مَا كَانُوا لِيُؤْمِنُوا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Allah is saying, if we were to send down the angels, and we were to resurrect the dead in front of them, and all of the creation were to speak to them face to face, they would still not believe. So this is another wisdom for not answering. Another wisdom is that Allah Azza wa Jal is above being so petty that every time somebody asks, you're going to get. And Allah Azza wa Jal has given enough signs that you should believe in those signs. Another wisdom is that Allah Azza wa Jal, if He is challenged, He takes the challenge but with a challenge back. He takes the challenge but with the challenge back. And the challenge back is that if you reject then you will face the punishment. And this is authentically mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, that once uh, they begged the Prophet ﷺ to convert Safa into gold. Of course they're greedy, they want the gold as well, right? So they begged to convert Safa into gold. And so the Prophet ﷺ felt that they're really sincere. And so he made a special dua to Allah. And he said, Oh Allah, convert Safa into gold for them. The mountain of Safa. By the way, the mountain of Safa was three, four times bigger than what you see. Even now, it will be worth a few billion. Back then, you are talking about half the gold of the whole world. Okay? So the Prophet felt that they're really close. So he said, Oh Allah, please convert the mountain of Safa, they will believe. And so Allah sent Jibreel down. And this is the sunnah of Allah. That Allah said, If you want, I will convert Safa into gold. But if they reject, they will not have a second chance. Because I don't play games. Allah says in the Quran that Allah, I didn't do this as a joke. I didn't create everything as a lahu and la'ib. Allah does not, it's too petty. You want to challenge Allah, it is not dignifying that Allah Azza wa Jal just give you everything you want on a silver platter. And so if you want, Allah said, I will change it. But if they refuse, the punishment will come instantaneously. And if you want, I will not change it, but they will have the opportunity then. Right? So the Prophet realized that he has a safer bet, right? With Hidayah than by leaving it open. And so he said, No, I'd rather leave it open to get the opportunity for guidance. And this is, of course, exactly what happened. And of course, there are many verses in the Quran, at least 20 verses that are about this. Allah says, The only reason we don't send signs is because even the earlier nations all rejected the signs. Allah says, How do you know, Ya Rasulullah? I know. How do you know that when the miracles come, they will actually reject the miracles? I know this Allah is saying. 
So the Prophet is being told there is a reason why I'm not answering all the miracles and he is being told you have enough miracles with you. And so he was given some miracles and denied others. The seventh tactic that they did, the seventh tactic that they did was attempts of a middle ground or attempts of outright bribery directly. Attempts of a middle ground. So negotiating directly with the Prophet ﷺ. We've already said they negotiated with Abu Talib, they negotiated with others. Now they try to negotiate directly with him. And different tactics are done. Of course, the classic example, Surah Al-Kafirun. Right? So they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Okay, let's reach a compromise. One day, we'll all be Muslim. And the next day, we'll all be Kafir basically, right? The next day, we'll worship our gods, right? One day, we worship our gods. And the next day, we worship Allah alone. Okay, so this is the compromise. Because it's getting out of hand now. People are converting, you're breaking up society. Let's reach this compromise. Of course, there is no compromise in Tawheed. And so Allah revealed in the Quran, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, oh, you who have rejected Islam, لا أعبدوا ما تعبدون. I, am, I don't worship what you worship. ولا أنتم عابدون ما أعبد. And neither do you worship who I worship. Pause here. They did worship Allah. How, could, how can Allah say, what does it mean when Allah says, you don't worship what I worship? Response, because when you worship Allah via shirk, you are not worshiping Allah. When you worship Allah via shirk, you are not worshipping Allah. So, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ And then, وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ Notice this is different than وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ That, قُلْ يَا كَفْرُ لَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ There's a difference. It's not the exact same. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ This is repeated. So there's four verses, back to back. The, the second and the fourth are exactly the same. وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ Right? The first and the third are different. لَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدُ and scholars have differed over 10 opinions about what is the difference between them. Shaykh Nusami ibn Taymiyyah ta'ala has a position which is that the, second, the first verse here, or the second verse of the surah, قُلْ يَعِلْ كَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ The reference is to the God, the gods and Allah. The reference is to the object of worship. And then, وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ The reference is to the actions of worship. What do you do to worship? So I pray, I fast, I give zakah. You have arrows that you throw in front of the idols, right? And you clap, and you whistle. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُمْ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَاءً وَتَصْطِيَ What is their... Prayer in front of the house except clapping and singing and whistling. So this, the, the verse, it actually refers to, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, what you do to worship. And the first two verses refers to who do you worship, right? So there's a difference here. That there is no compromise. You have your way, I have my way, I cannot compromise. And uh, once they sent a delegation to the Prophet along with, uh, uh, in Abu Talib's house, so they call for a meeting. So they try to go behind his back to Abu Talib. Now they call for a meeting with him. And they proposition to him directly that what can we do so that you get rid of this message? What do you want? And so he says, I only want one word from you. Now they understood this as one condition. Yani one word from you. And so Abu Lahab stood up and said, one word, wallahi, will give you ten. And you want any, you know, by, by one kalima, one kalima, he meant like one, you know, you're saying, I want one statement from you, right? So you understand, like, I just want one condition. That's how Abu Jahl understood it, right? And so he stood up, he goes, one, we will lie, we'll give you ten if you stop doing this. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, the kalima that I want is, La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. And so uh, Abu Jahl says that, uh, and Allah revealed this in the Quran, Surah Sad, that has He made our objects into one, objects of worship into one, this is something that is uh, w crazy, we've never heard of this before. And of course the most famous incident of outright bribery, the most famous incident is that of uh, Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah, and Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah uh, was from the Banu Hashim, and he was of the uh, distant uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was a man of wisdom and a man of learning. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ himself called him a man of wisdom and learning. Who knows when? Quiz question. Who knows when Utbah ibn al-Rabi'ah was praised by the Prophet ﷺ? 
very close. Before Badr, not after Badr. Before Badr, right before Badr. At the battle of Badr, before Badr had begun, right? So, uh, footnote here, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, who is he? He is from the Banu Hashim, but the Banu Abd Banaf. He is a distant uh, father's cousin, basically, of the Prophet Wasallam. And, by the way, he is the one whom, when the Prophet is returning to, from Ta'if, he's all bloodied, he's all bruised, and he's close to Mecca. He sits in the garden of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. And Utbah sees him bloodied and bruised, and he's the one who commands the Christian, the historian Christian Adi, to go and give him the grapes. This is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. He has some soft spot and he has uh, wisdom. And when was he called wise? On, on the Battle of Badr, on the day of the Battle of Badr, before the Battle of Badr, when the Prophet was looking at the distance and he sees the armies lined up and he sees a man racing back and forth on a red camel, saying something. Nobody can hear what he's saying because there's half a mile away. He's saying something. And the Prophet ﷺ said to the, the, the Muslims, he said to the Muslims that if the Quraysh have any good in them, they will listen to the wise man on the red camel. That was Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, and he was trying to prevent the battle of Badr. And he was going back and forth saying, Oh people, there is your brother, there is your father, there is your uncle. How can you fight them? Right? How are you going for war? You're going to kill these people? Uh, who's going to be the victor? We're going to get to this inshallah whenever we get to it, right? Who's going to be the victor? If you die, you die. If you win, you've killed your brother. How would you like to be the murderer of your own brother? So he gave them a moving sermon. But of course, Abu Jahl annulled it. Abu Jahl stood up and completely abrogated with his rhetoric. So Utbah then fought and he was killed in the Battle of Badr. Him and his brother and his son all were killed in the Battle of Badr. They were killed at the very beginning when the Mubaraza happened, right? Between Ali and Hamza and others. So we'll talk about that. I'm jumping the gun. That's a different uh, topic, inshallah. Get back over here. Where are we? Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. So the Quraysh are sitting in their, in their uh, nadi, in their uh, gathering, uh, their senate, their congress, and they are simply cursing the process and making fun of him, saying, what are we going to do? Things have gone too much. Utbah says, have any of you actually tried to negotiate with him? And they say, well, no, we haven't done that. Well, Utbah says, well, obviously, then that's what needs to be done. Look, he's a nephew of mine. He's a nephew, nephew of mine. Send me as your representative. Okay, allow me to speak on your behalf. I'm sure we can work something out with the guy, right? And he's a sane man. We know him since he's a child. You know, he's, uh, he's been a good person. Let's just work some compromise out. So this is Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. And so uh, they say, Khalas, whatever you need, you are our representative. Go and try to negotiate a treaty with the man. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, sitting in front of the Kaaba. Utbah comes to him and says, Oh my nephew, again he's an elder, and the Prophet is you know, 45 years old, and he's in his 50s or 60s, he knows him since he's a child. So, oh my nephew, you know your status, and you know your lineage in your society, you are the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, the son of Abdul Muttalib, you know, you are who you are. Now you've come forth with a matter that has really caused havoc in our society. Oh Muhammad, وسلم, are you better or Abdullah? Oh Muhammad are you better or Abdul Muttalib? These are trick questions. They're loaded questions. You cannot answer them. Right? Because in fact, who is better? The Prophet right? But from Utbah's perspective, this is blasphemy. No young man is going to say he's better than his father, grandfather, the founder of the tribe. Especially Abdul Muttalib. Come on. You know, are you better? Now, for me, this is a beautiful point of wisdom here. When you're asked trap questions, you're not allowed to lie. We, I've said this many times. Our religion does not allow us to have double faces. I say one thing to you in private and another to them in public. No, we are open about what we believe. But you can't answer every question to satisfy the questioner because their intellectual level is different. I mean, this is a man steeped in jahiliyyah. And for him, it is, it is just completely a given that Abdul Muttalib was the greatest Arab ever. And you're his grandson. So it's a trick question. The Prophet ﷺ did not even answer. This is wisdom. Many of our youngsters would have blurted out, of course I'm better because I'm Tawheed and this is Shirk. But you're going to lose the battle for the sake of a trick question. Quiet. Because you're not going to understand our Utbah. So he didn't answer. Utbah 
understand this to mean victory, but the Prophet was quiet. And then uh, he kept on going and he goes, I have, we have never seen any young man as promising as you flip around and become so unpromising. Yani you were such a symbol of optimism. We had our hopes in you. <laughs> and Astaghfirullah is saying, what a desolate failure you have become. Astaghfirullah. Why? Because you have broken our society. You had so much potential, we have not seen any young man bring forth more harm to his people than you have. The Arabs are all making fun of us. The people are mocking your call. You have split us up. And it is just a matter of time. He used an expression which is interesting uh, in the Arabic language. We don't have it in English. He said, we're waiting for the cry of the pregnant woman. You know the pregnant woman in the ninth month? Those of you who have children know this. You're on call all the time, right? That last moment, you're just waiting for that phone call or that cry. That it started and khalas, panic mode begins, right? This is an expression in the Arabic language, okay? The cry of the pregnant woman. This means that any second is going to happen. We're just waiting for the cry of the pregnant woman to have civil war. Wallahi, this was true. Badr was around the corner, a few years down the line, right? We're just waiting for anything to have a civil war. So, you're an intelligent man. Listen to me. I will propose certain conditions. Perhaps you'll agree to one or more of them. And then he gives his list. Because this is the list coming from his mind that he's used to. If you wish for money, if that's why you're doing this, then I have the power of the Quraysh invested in me. We will give you more money than anybody of us have. Collectively, we'll collect, raise funds for you. Have fundraisers, give it all to you. And you shall be the richest of the Arabs. If you want power, we will make you our king. The Arabs did not have a king. The Quraysh did not have a king. But now they are so desperate... They are saying, we'll give you the title of king and anything that we want, you will have to agree and sign to it. You'll become our ruler. And can you believe in their hatred of Islam, they're willing to unify? Can you believe that? Because they're never unified. Every tribe is wanting to be boss. But if they're that desperate, we'll make you our king. And if you want women, go choose any woman that you want and we'll make sure that she is married to you. I mean, after all, this is what three things that men want, right? Power, money, and women. That's what men want. What else do they want besides this? So if you want women, choose any woman that you want. And we will make sure that she is married to you, right? And so he gave all of these conditions. Of course, he also added a fourth one. If you think you're sick, we'll, we'll, we'll hire doctors to cure you as well. If it's a mental problem, we'll go to the best doctors in the nation. And we'll make sure that we will uh, get this cured. So when he's finished, uh, the Prophet wasallam said, Are you done, ya Abu al-Walid, his kunya? Abu al-Walid, al-Walid ibn Utbah also died in the battle of Badr. His son was al-Walid. Are you done, ya Abu al-Walid? And subhanAllah, this is the wisdom of the Prophet wasallam. He never interrupted. He never interrupted. The simple habit that we are used to in this society, I have to say Muslim culture has abandoned, but the West still has it. You don't interrupt a person when they're speaking. You let them finish. Not just that, you then ask, are you done? Or anything else? He goes, no, that's all I have. So then he said, now listen to me. Now it's my turn. And then he began, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ حَامِيمِ وَالْكِتَابِ الْمُبِينِ And he begins reciting Surah Fussilat. He begins reciting Surah Fussilat. Now just like the rest of the Quraysh, Utbah has never actually listened wholeheartedly to the Qur'an, يعني a passage or a section of the Qur'an, right? And so Utbah was sitting back, because he goes, when he's done, he put his hands back. To relax, basically. Yes, I'm done. Now it's your turn. Okay? And as the Prophet ﷺ continued reciting, and he continued going verse by verse, Utbah's expression begins to change. And he begins to palpitate. And there's a verse in Surah Fussilat that says, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ Right Now, I, I wanted to actually recite it and go over verse by verse. Unfortunately, as usual, um, I don't have the time to go into that much detail. But wallahi, th these are things that need to be done. I, I want you all to go back and read Fussilat, not translation. Read it and see the power, the, the, the rhythm, the tempo is building up. And then Allah says, if they turn away, 
then warn them that a punishment will come and a destruction just like the destruction of Ad and Thamud. When he recited this, Utbah jumped up and he put his hand on the mouth of the Prophet and said, I beg you by Allah and by the rights that I have over you as your blood relative to stop and don't send this punishment. I beg you, and shuduka billah. Yani it's moved him. Can you imagine hearing the tilawah of the Prophet right? It's moved him that he is now trembling. And he turns and he runs back to the same group who has now sent him as their authority and delegates. And he says to them, listen to me. Like he tried to listen, they could listen to them in Badr, but they never listened. Listen to me. Leave this man alone. Leave this man alone because I have heard a speech from him that I have never heard before. Again, the power of the Quran. And I could not comprehend all of it. Yani, their scholars have differed why people say this. Some people say because the words were so advanced. But in fact, they were not that advanced. What really it is is that, as Allah says, that when there's so much shirk, there is a ghishawa on their hearts. And so they accept, they understand some phrases and others, it's just beyond them at that point in time until they accept Islam. I could not understand all of it. However, he is going to have an importance. Sha'an. He's going to have, he's going to cause some scene on the, on the, in, the, in the world if you like. And if the Arabs get rid of him for us, then our hands are clean because he's a fellow Qurashi. We're not allowed to touch him, right? If the other Arabs get rid of him, then our job is done. But if he wins over the Arabs, then wallahi, his victory is our victory and his power is our power. I mean, isn't this a pragmatic wise man? He's not a believer, he never accepted. But this is what you call pragmatism. Look, leave the guy alone. If he really is not worth it, somebody else will do the job and kill him. Let us not do it because he's our tribesman. And if he is what he is saying he is, then his victory is our victory. And his success is our success. Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ We have revealed to you a book, in it will be your honor. Your dhikr. The Arabs would have been, with, I'm not trying to be racist because I'm not Arab, they would have been a fit, footnote in history. Wallahi, they would have had nothing to give, just like some of the tribes of Africa, whatever, that we don't even know about in the past, right? Some of the Aborigines, we don't know anything about them. The Arabs would have been another footnote. But Allah says, we have given you a book, you will become the rulers. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ Your legacy will be through the Qur'an. And that's exactly what happened. That because of the Qur'an, the Arabs became the rulers of the world. And the Arabs went to a height that even the Romans and the Persians and everybody else was left behind. Right? And so this is what uh, Utbah is telling them yani many, many decades before the actual rise happens. When Utbah said this, they said as they always said to everybody else, he has bewitched you like he bewitched everybody else. Right? Continuing on, they cannot accept the truth as it comes to them. And there's much more to say, but as usual, unfortunately, we have run out of time. And so inshallah ta'ala, I open the floor for five, six minutes of questions, and then we will continue, uh, resume later on inshallah ta'ala. Questions? Yes. When Abu Jahl was given the title of like when was it Some scholars say that uh, this was a title given to him by the Prophet uh, Of course, his name is Amr. His name is Amr. Uh, and he was called the father of wisdom before this. Uh, uh, and the father of power. And so some say that when he rejected Islam, then he was called uh, Abu Jahl. However, it sounds good to say that, however, he was also called Abu Jahl by the Quraysh. And therefore, yani Allahu A'lam, I, I, I don't have a definitive answer. I do not have a definitive answer. When was he called Abu Jahl? Was it the Prophet and then the Quraysh took it from him? Or was it something that happened before Islam? There are two opinions. <laughs> I don't know which one is the stronger one. Allah knows best. Sisters, any question? Yes, Sabrina. Um, did the pre-Islamic Arabs believe in jinns? Jinn stories, huh? Did the pre-Islamic Arabs believe in jinns? Yes, they believed in jinns. In fact, every society on earth, without exception, uh, 
believes in something called the jinn or supernatural or ghosts or spirits. Every society on earth, uh, whether it is African tribes, Aborigines, we just mentioned, every society. If you look at it anthropologically, uh, historically, and this is to this day, uh, you know, ancient Europe, medieval Europe, it's only in modern times where we think we have, you know, left superstition. Otherwise, it was a well-known uh, fact amongst every society that there is an entity that is not human. And they gave it different names. They called it spirits, they called it ghosts. Of course, for us, we know that it is a jinn. So yes, the Arabs did believe in the jinn. Yes. Um, so this is a question about the whole sphere in general. Um, you know, one of the most important relationships that we have as people is our relationship to our parents. What was the wisdom or what was the reason, if knowing that we are not able to see how the Prophet uh, uh, interacted with his parents? Uh, the question is about what is the wisdom of the Prophet and being uh, an orphan. In fact, uh, five, six weeks ago, I talked about this for like 20 minutes. Uh, about this exact question. Exactly. What is the wisdom? Why, did, why didn't Allah Azza wa Jal just give the process and parents and the lap of luxury? Why was he an orphan? And we talked about this for around 20 minutes. I, I recommend you go back. But to summarize, some of the wisdoms uh, was so that uh, the Prophet his tarbiyah or his taking care could literally, it would be from Allah directly. Nobody could have said that he had a, that type of influence. Because an orphan really is an independent person in many ways. Even if you're taking care of by food and drink, but in terms of thought, in terms of nourishment, in terms of intellectual nourishment, the Prophet was left to himself. And so Allah took care of him. Another reason is that, uh, the, uh, is that orphans, they grow up to be more mature and more intelligent and more merciful. And the Prophet needed all of these characteristics, right? Uh, and the, uh, there's a sense of independence that the orphan would have uh, that would help them to be braver in, when they're facing persecution. And all of these characteristics, the Prophet them needed them uh, to be a Prophet of Allah. And there are other wisdoms that scholars derive, uh, but these are the main ones, and Allah Azza knows best. Yes? Uh, two of the daughters of the Prophet were indeed engaged to Abu Lahab's sons. You need to realize that in that culture, uh, it was common for young children to be engaged because they wanted to book, they wanted to lock it into play. Everything is lineage. Everything is lineage. So you want your child's husband or wife, right, to be a person of good lineage. And so before the coming of Islam, no doubt Abu Lahab is uh, an uncle, and Abu Lahab, uh, as children, is, is obviously uh, the grandchildren of Abdul Muttalib as well. And so two of the daughters, Abu Lahab, had already booked them for his own sons, right? And so even though they were not of marriageable age, uh, they were young girls at the time, but they had been booked, and then when Islam began, then of course it, uh, Abu Lahab uh, annulled it. Not in the Makki period, no. The, the consummation had not occurred anyway. Not in the Makki period. Other questions? Two minutes left. Yes? What was the relationship between Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab? A lot of people get confused. Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab are two different people. A lot of people get confused. Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab are two different people, two different tribes. Abu Lahab is mentioned in the Quran. That's how you'll remember it. Tabat yada Abi Lahab. And Abu Lahab is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, right? He is the uncle from a grandmother who only had him. Abdul Muttalib had five wives. Abdul Muttalib had five wives. One of them gave birth to Abu Lahab, and they had no other children besides that. So Abu Lahab is a unique mother. And then uh, another of them is the, the grandmother of the Prophet ﷺ, and also Abu Talib's mother. So Abu Talib and Abdullah were full brothers, okay? Abu Talib and Abdullah were full brothers, uh, uh, and that's why Abu Talib took care of the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Jahl has nothing to do with the Banu Hashim. He's from the Banu Makhzum, a different tribe. And Abu Jahl is the one whom the Prophet ﷺ called the Fir'aun of my Ummah. So Abu Jahl is the Fir'aun of my Ummah. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said, right? Uh, and so that is a status that even Abu Lahab does not have. Okay. Is that his real name, Abu Lahab? 
<laughs> Abu Lahab was his kunya before Islam for sure. He has a name, it doesn't come to me now. Abdul Uzza, that's the one. Abdul Uzza was his name. But Abu Lahab was given to him before Islam. And it was a name of praise that he is a man of fire. And so Allah used it as a name of mockery. So Abu Lahab for sure, the kunya was before the coming of Islam. And that was a name of praise for him. Uh, final point to this. This weekend is a packed weekend, alhamdulillah, for MIC. Uh, because I'm here, alhamdulillah, for a long time. Uh, so on Saturday, we have a very special guest speaker coming. I really strongly encourage you to attend. He's a good friend of mine as well. Mashallah, very, uh, very intellectual, very good historian. He's doing a, finishing up a PhD from, uh, from uh, NYU uh, in Islamic history. And he's going to be giving a talk about Andalus and some benefits from Andalus. I'll be joining him for Barakah, inshallah, for his Barakah, not mine. Uh, I might give a few words, but I'm, I'm not an expert as much as he is in Andalus. So he'll be talking about Andalus. That is on Saturday. Uh, at what time? Balani, yes, at what time? You don't know. Huh? What time do you advertise? After Maghrib? Okay, so it's Saturday, so after Salat al-Maghrib. So be here for Salat al-Maghrib. Inshallah, you don't have a problem coming on Saturday for Salat al-Maghrib. So after Salat al-Maghrib, uh, we'll pray Maghrib, and then uh, after all, we'll start the class, inshallah. On Sunday at 11 a.m., the sisters have their halaqa. We'll resume that. I give a halaqa once a month for the sisters. So please uh, send that to the sisters' uh, list as well. The sisters have a halaqa on Sunday. And on Sunday night... There is a family activity. Everyone is welcome. Uh, after Maghrib prayer, presentation starts at 6.45. Searching for the stars, learning about astronomy. We are inviting the Memphis Astronomical Society to come here and they will bring some telescopes. Let me add, if any of you have telescopes, bring them as well. We'll have some more telescopes. Uh, so they're going to bring four or five. I'm sure each one will have a long line. So the more telescopes you have, just bring them and inshallah it will be beneficial for us. And... Uh, we're going to be looking at the, the, the stars, we're going to be looking at Venus and the Sirius and the North Star and, and uh, whatever else they'll tell us. And so we're looking forward to that on Sunday night at 6.45. Uh, and so after Maghrib, so both Saturday and Sunday, mashallah, busy, and Sunday afternoon for the sisters at 11. Uh, what is this? Faith, family, and fun. Tired of turning off your lights? Oh, this is for Halloween. <laughs> oh, this is, I'm supposed to be speaking. Yes, okay. I see my name on the flyer. So apparently I'm supposed to be speaking here. Okay. Uh, this is on Monday. Wow, we'll have a very busy weekend this weekend. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, all three days, unfortunately, you'll be seeing me. So on Monday, instead of pretending you're not home and turning the lights off, right? Uh, inshallah, come over to uh, uh, PVS and we're going to be having a little bit of a carnival over there, uh, games, uh, ice cream, uh, and there's going to be a book uh, Islamic book fair as well, and stories for Muslims, cakes, balloons, toss the balloon, soccer kick, etc., etc. Aha! No costume allowed. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a Muslim ethnic day. <laughs> let, me, let me say costumes are allowed if they're ethnic. Wear your shawar kameez, wear your thobes, but please, no, no shayateen al insi wal jinn, please. We don't, we don't want any shayateen, okay? Um, so this is going to be on Monday uh, at 6 to 8, and it's a good way to get out of your houses, really, instead of just pretending to be out of your houses, inshallah. Uh, and yes, by the way, I do believe we should not be celebrating Halloween. Some of you asked me this. Clearly, this is a festival that has too much pagan elements in it. It's a bit too clear. And so we draw the line here. I might not draw the line elsewhere, but here we draw the line and we say Halloween and Christmas and these things, it is not a part of our Sharia. And even we should avoid giving even candy. Give candy on another day. Yeah, give candy on Eid. Why don't you want to give sweets on Eid? Our Eid, go give sweets to the neighbors, right? But on Halloween, you don't want to participate in such a festival. Try to avoid it. It is safer for our deen, inshallah ta'ala. And inshallah ta'ala, with this we will call the adhan for Salat al-Isha. حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون